All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Museum of the Albemarle for today's History for Lunch presentation. Um, if you haven't already, we have our September and October program calendar available at the reception desk. Um, so if you want to pick one of those up on your way out, uh, it has all our programs listed uh, through October. Um, for those of y'all who are here in the auditorium, we just ask that you silence your cell phones. And for those of y'all on Zoom, we ask that you please mute your microphone and then use the chat for your questions. And as always, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Uh, now, a reminder that the next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, September 18th at noon, uh, featuring Chris Meekins. Um, he is uh, was born and raised in Elizabeth City. He's been a public historian with the state of North Carolina for over 30 years. Uh, he is head of the North Carolina Troops uh, Roster Project, uh, focusing on uh, soldiers from North Carolina in the Civil War. Uh, so he will be presenting on um, how that project has evolved um, over the uh, decades um, as he is, is currently leading that project. Uh, so again, that is September 18th at noon. Uh, and today we welcome Mr. Lee Holder. Uh, he has been a member of the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust since 2003. Uh, he presently serves as a regional director on the Council's Program Planning Committee and the Eastern North Carolina Coordinator for the Council's, council's Traveling Exhibits. Um, he is part of the Council's six-person team that wrote the new curriculum for North Carolina's Gisela Abramson Holocaust Education Act. Uh, and in 2020, Mr. Holder established the Gisela Gross Abrams Abramson Resource Center uh, for Holocaust and Civil Rights in Kinston, North Carolina. Um, so today we will hear the story of Gisela Abramson uh, through her eyes. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Holder. Thank you. Because it is such an honor to be here today. Uh, you'll have to work with me a little bit. I'm very used to moving all around the stage or the, the room, so I'm going to try to stay planted like I'm supposed to. And I would like to tell the story of the Holocaust through the eyes of one of the survivors that moved to North Carolina. Uh, it is Gisela Gross Abramson, and I met her in 1990. And I would like, however, to start off with, if I can get these buttons right, just showing you the faces of some of these survivors that moved to North Carolina. I've been able to find information on 304 Holocaust survivors and refugees that moved to North Carolina. I am getting that list formatted now, and it's got lots of resources and information about these survivors. I will send it to the museum if anyone would like to have a copy of it. Uh, it should be finished by the end of the week, so just let the museum or myself know, and I will be glad to share that with you. So you're looking into the eyes of some of the survivors. If you look at this list, Walter Ziffer up on the top left-hand corner is still alive. Simon Lewenberg is still alive. I believe he just turned 101. And then you have Gerhard Weinberg. He is still with us. A uh, famous Chapel Hill historian has written uh, numerous books. Uh, Peter Stein, who was a dear friend, just passed away about 10 days ago. And uh, this last bit here, Zev Harrell is still alive. Barbara Rodbell is still alive. Renee Fink is still alive. She spoke at one of our presentations a couple of weeks ago. Sully Chinkin is alive. Shelly Weiner and Margot LeBray, who's not on this, is turning 100 this month, and she'll be uh, speaking at one of our webinars. So 304 survivors that uh, moved to North Carolina. Why is it? that this one has touched my soul, Gisela Abramson. And I want to tell her story, and uh, I hope I do it justice. I always feel like Gisela's over my shoulder uh, watching what I do. So uh, I do hope I do this justice. A little bit of background information. I started teaching in 1988. Um, in 1990, I, this was my classroom. In 1990, I got an offer to go to a workshop on the Holocaust. Uh, presented by the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust. It was in Washington. And to be honest with you, I probably went just as much to get a day out of school and away from school as much as I did for the learning value of the experience. So I, I left that day and in true typical Lee Holder fashion, I got lost. Uh, this is all pre-GPS, but even with GPS, I tend to get lost. So I got lost. I got there late. And 
it was an auditorium about like this, maybe a little larger. And as I got there, I looked through the door and every seat was taken except for one. Right in the middle of the front row, there was one seat open. And I almost didn't stay. I have social anxiety. I don't, I don't like being around large crowds. It, I just, it just is something I have to overcome. So I almost turned around and left. But I decided to stay. I'd taken the day off. Uh, I knew it would be a valuable experience. So I walked through the crowd. I sat down. I sort of scrunched in my chair so my big head wouldn't be blocking anyone's way. And I'm being literal here, not figurative. At one o'clock that day, and I know it was one o'clock because Gisela was always on time. She was never late. At one o'clock that day, Gisela stepped out and my life changed. It changed immediately. It made me or helped make me the person I am today. It made me a better teacher, a better person, eventually a better, better father. Following her example and following her advice was what changed my entire outlook on education. This is Gisela all four foot 10 of her. At one o'clock, she walked out and stood right in the middle of the stage. Remember, I'm in the front row middle and I don't know how to explain it to you, but my eyes locked with hers and my eyes stayed on her eyes the entire hour and a half. It was like I was seeing everything she experienced, all the depths, all the joys when she came to America, the joys of rescue, the depths when she was thrown into my Donick death camp. Uh, I experienced everything by looking in her eyes. Now, Ellie Vazell once said, when you hear a witness, you become a witness. Gisela was much simpler. She just looked at us at the end, and it was almost like a mic drop moment. She just quietly looked at us. She scanned the room and then just said, tag, you're it. I knew what she meant. Survivors wouldn't be around forever. We need to now tell her story. And the next day, I, I probably rushed this a bit, but the next day I called her and asked her, I'd asked for her phone number at the end of the, the uh, presentation that day. I called her and asked her to bring my students to uh, visit her and for them to hear her story. And she got a little quiet. And that's when I thought maybe I overstepped my boundary. And I never forget it. She said, well, Mr. Holder, can you give me a couple of days so I can straighten my living room first? And I was like, Mrs. Abramson, there's no way I'm gonna bring 90 students into your house. Uh, can we find somewhere we can meet? And for 25 years, at least every year, if not every semester, uh, we loaded up the bus and I took my students to visit Gisela Abramson at her synagogue in Raleigh. To give you an idea of what sort of person she was, uh, she would meet us in the morning and she stayed up herself late at night and baked, baked goods for us so my students wouldn't be hungry. I tried to tell her that we're only coming 90 miles. My students are fine. Their book bags are filled with candy. We'll make it. But she said, Mr. Holder, there's always a chance one of them did not have breakfast and they will be hungry. So she baked food for us. She told the story. My students were enthralled. Uh, they will never forget that moment in their, their high school career. And then at the end of the day, she would always grab the rabbi, no matter what the rabbi was doing, and they would come out and bless our bus so we would make it home safely. That sort of gives you an idea of who Gisela was. Gisela was born is down in the bottom uh, southeastern corner of Poland. Uh, notice the question mark here. I thought Gisela was born on August 22nd, 1928. Her son thought she was born on August 22nd, 1928. At her funeral, we discovered she was actually born in 1926 on that date. Her parents, not her parents, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Her relatives changed the date of her birth when she came to America so she could qualify to get into a high school and get her education. Uh, and then she went on to college from there. So we don't know if Gisela knew that or and just kept it secret. But to make it even more interesting, this summer, Poland released some of their census information. Uh, and it's very little because most of it was destroyed during the war. The G's were actually there for her area. Uh, her last name was Gross. And I found out in actuality, and we now have the, the, the census information, she was born on August 22nd, 1924, which makes more sense to her family. When you hear what she went through in the Holocaust, that age range that she would have been 15 when the war started, that makes a little bit more sense. This is the only photograph Gisela had of her mother. Uh, this is her mother. Her name was Hannah. 
They lived on a farm in eastern Poland. Uh, she lived with her dad, Marcel, her little brother, Zenon, and her grandmother, Rachel. Now, even though they lived in eastern Poland, Gisela's grandmother, Rachel, was from western Poland near the German border. And ironically, Rachel, her grandmother, taught Gisela German because she knew Germany was a great country and one day it would help you if you were able to speak German, you would be able to get ahead in the world with that language. Little did she know when she taught her German, it, helped, it would help uh, save Gisela's life. So Gisela speaks Polish and she speaks German. She's uh, multilingual there. Uh, their farm was uh, not mechanized, even though they did have indoor plumbing and some indoor conveniences. Gisela, looking at this picture, if you look on the window to the right of her mother, one window back is where Gisela's bedroom was, and Gisela's earliest memory are of the lilacs that grew outside her window. My daughter, I think she was kindergarten or first grade, painted a painting of lilacs uh, and, and gave it to Gisela, and uh, Gisela wheeled it back to me when she passed away, but that's the painting there on the left. So this is their farm in eastern Poland. This is a photo of Gisela with her cousin. She is dressed up, looking beautiful. Uh, her little brother, her cousin. Uh, this is from 1938. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this, this is one of few, a few of the photographs that survived, family photographs. 1938 in November is when Gisela remembers becoming politically conscious of what was going on in the world. In 1938 in Germany, that was Kristallnacht, that organized attack against Jews. Uh, where synagogues were attacked, homes were attacked, uh, Jews were attacked, uh, about 100 Jews were murdered, about 30,000 were marched off to camps, and Gisela became aware of what was going on in 1938 because she remembered her parents talking about this at the table. Was she scared? Probably not because it was in Germany, but she became aware that there was anti-Semitism out there and Jews were being attacked by their next door neighbor. These are all the places, Crystal and I, I want to do a little segue for 1938, and I'll explain as we go along. Here is uh, all the sites in Germany, or at least most of the sites in Germany, where these attacks took place. You can see it was rampant across the country. These are some photographs. In the top left, you have a home being ransacked. You have Jews being marched off to a camp. You have a building, a synagogue being set on fire, and you have Jewish uh, stores being vandalized. Kristallnacht means night of broken glass. So because of all the glass in the street from all this vandalism and, and destruction, that's where this event gets its name. This is a famous photograph. And if we were in a classroom where I'm most comfortable, I would ask my students, what do they see in this? And eventually they will get around to the key points. These are men being marched off to a camp. Uh, this is in Rothenburg, I believe. Uh, notice it is during daylight, which is what I want my students to notice. So they're not doing this in the dead of the night. They're not doing it in the night and fog. This is something being done in the open. Notice there are people lined up on both sides watching this. Notice there is a child running along. I don't know what he's saying. I can imagine from talking to survivors what he might be saying. People will stop. They're watching this. I think, and I'll never be able to verify this, but if you look up here, right here, it looks like this woman's actually filming this. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true, but this is not something that's being done in secret. For instance, and I've got a copy of the New York Times up here. This was reported in American newspapers that very day. And it was in the New York Times, also the most popular magazine in America at the time. And I've got a copy of it down here, if you'd like to look at it later, is Life. Life ran an article about this. So Americans are seeing this information as it rolls out. They know things are going on. Now, my students would come back at me and argue, but Mr. Holder, that's New York City. We live in Kinston. Kinston doesn't know what's going on. Maybe New Yorkers do, but Kinstonians don't. And when they say that, I look at a picture of Kinston. This is Kinston in 1938. There's our newspaper. Notice in the top right-hand corner, there are articles about what's going on in Germany that very day. Uh, and for the next week or so, there are articles about what's being done to the Jews in Germany. So we're reading about this in Little Kinston, North Carolina. Population was about 20,000. There are even cartoons. This one has 
political cartoons. This one has always set me thinking. You have here minorities being attacked by racial hatred. So we're condemning Germany for their racial, 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 racial hatred against the Jews. And you can imagine what an African-American must have been thinking when they saw this in 1938 in the Kinston newspaper. Now, I tried very hard uh, digitally to find some photographs of Elizabeth City from 1938. I wanted to use those instead of the Kinston ones. I was able to find these. Uh, this on the top left-hand corner is just a, an airplane view of Elizabeth City. And I believe this would be Elizabeth City State uh, which was, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was the state colored normal school. Uh, I believe that's correct. And the one newspaper that's digitized was the Independent from Elizabeth City. They ceased publication in 1937. So I couldn't find the newspaper from 38 and the Daily Advance. I didn't see any digital copies online. I wanted to share that with you. But these are from the year before. And I think it's incredible uh, this was from the News and Observer, but the Elizabeth City uh, Independent reprinted it. And where it talks about no middle ground, it's comparing what the Nazis are doing with the KKK, which from rural southern North Carolina, that's pretty progressive to have those articles in the newspaper. And there's one over here uh, to the right hand side that talks about uh, young people in Germany now being trained for the military uh, and not for their regular schooling. So it's very progressive, some of the things the newspapers here in Elizabeth City were printing. And last uh, thing, I just want to think about all those families. We talked about Gisela's family, but there are millions of family. Here is a Jewish family from Bulgaria in 1938. Only two people in this photograph are going to survive. And I always like to look at anything historical from a local lens. So I always show this family photograph. This is from Charleston. South Carolina in 1938. Uh, the adults in this photograph had to be reading the newspapers and knowing what's going on. And the reason I show this photograph in the bottom uh, row all the way over uh, next to the father is my dad. Uh, this is my dad in 1938. And lastly, what, once again, if we were in a classroom, I would ask my students, what is everyone doing in this photo? And they would tell me that's the Hitler salute. This must be a school in Germany. In reality, this is in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Uh, many of you probably know this, but this is the Bellamy salute. This is the way Americans pledged allegiance using this salute. It wasn't changed, I think, until 1941 or 42 when we went to war with Germany and we realized the resemblance between this and the Nazi salute. So it's called the Bellamy salute. Getting back to Gisela. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Gisela said her family always felt safe because Russia was there to defend Poland against Germany. They were shocked when earlier Germany and Russia signed a non-aggression non pact. But what they didn't realize, there was a secret clause in that where Germany would take Western Poland and Russia would take Eastern Poland. So a few weeks after the Germans invaded Western Poland, the Soviet Union invaded Eastern Poland. They uh, confiscated one of the first places they hit was Gisela's area of Poland. They took her farm. Uh, they uh, took all of their belongings. They took their bank account. They took all their animals. They basically only left them with the clothes on their back. And for some weakness of generosity, let them keep one wagon and one horse. So Gisela and her family were forced to move out of the house and they were in one side note, which we won't go into a lot of detail. Gisela's family was one of the few Jewish families that owned their own farm. And they did that because uh, one of her ancestors saved, saved the life of one of the Lord's children 100 years earlier. And her ancestor, when asked, you know, what can I do for you by the Lord, uh, said, let me own my own farm. And so they did. So they were one of the few families, but now they've lost it. They were forced to live in a tent in the, on, on the acreage around the farm. And Gisela's dad realized this is not sustainable. We need to go somewhere. We're going to freeze this winter. Luckily, they had a small one-bedroom apartment in a town called Preshmil, which was nearby. Uh, he had inherited it. Her dad had inherited it. So the family moved to Preshmil. They're going to be there for a little over a year. 
Now, life was very tough for Giselle and her family, but it wasn't necessarily because they were Jewish. It was because the Soviets were treating all Poles very harshly. Gisela had to go to a school, uh, a new school that was run by the Russians. Polish was outlawed. So Gisela learns Russian. Gisela now speaks three languages, Russian, Polish, and German. So they're there. Life is getting tougher and tougher. Every week they have less to, to live on. Uh, Gisela's beloved grandmother, Rachel, passed away. And then in the summer of 41, Gisela's parents go to her with an offer uh, it's summertime, you are a teenager, how would you like to go stay with your uncle in luck and spend the summer there? Gisela always thought, as I think, that this was a gesture of Gisela getting older, but it was also an indication they probably didn't have enough money to keep the whole family going, and the uncle who was a doctor might be better supported to help Gisela out. So Gisela, that summer of 41, uh, hugged her parents, uh, kissed her family goodbye, and went to stay with her uncle. And that's how far she traveled from Tarnopol to Luck. Uh, so she's just going to spend the summer there. She leaves in May. She's going to come back in three months. So she's living in Soviet-occupied Luck now with her uncle Yannick, who is a doctor, her aunt Lucia, now they're Jewish also, and her two younger cousins, Emil and Eugenia. And these are just some photos I found of Luck. Little did anyone know that on June 22nd, 1941, uh, Nazi Germany is going to invade the Soviet Union through Soviet-occupied Poland. It's called Operation Barbarossa. They very quickly overrun the land, and Gisela gets separated from her parents. Little does she know she will never see them again. Sadly, all three of her uh, family members, her mother, her father, and her little brother, Zenon, are going to be murdered at Belzic. Uh, however, Gisela doesn't find out about that until after the war. So she's stranded now, she's frantic, she misses her parents, and she goes from living in Soviet-occupied luck to Nazi-occupied luck. And almost overnight, all these anti-Jewish laws and decrees that were instituted against the, Ger uh, the German Jews are now instituted against the Jewish people in uh, Nazi-occupied Poland. So everything from wearing the star, all the other curfews are there. Now the Germans employ Ukrainian guards to guard the city and Gisela being very smart realizes that she needs to communicate with these people in order to survive or to help her family survive during these impossible times. So Gisela learns Ukrainian. She now speaks four languages. Now, there are two stories I promised Gisela I would always share with people when talking or telling her story, and they both happen in luck. I don't know if you've ever heard, I'm sure you have, heard the phrase, sticks and stones might break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Gisela said, please tell everyone, especially adults, that is the biggest lie out there. As you'll see, Gisela goes to work for the underground. She works with the Soviet partisans. She gets captured. She's tortured. She's beaten. She has lie poured on her head. She is, uh, her teeth are knocked out. Her arms and one of her legs are broken. She ends up at a death camp. She's sent to the gas chambers three times. Uh, and I'll tell you how she survived that. But Gisela was brutally treated. She told my students every year, I do not remember what that pain felt like. I can't remember any of that. I just can't recollect it. But I do remember every single time somebody called me a dirty Jew. And it still burns me 60 years later that I was called that. And it still hurts my soul. And I still have nightmares about that, especially when it is young people calling her a dirty Jew, uh, children she used to play with. She, she said, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names also hurt. So please, she was like one of the first anti-bullying people that I ever met in North Carolina. She was very defensive of, of, of uh, people who were being bullied and very outspoken for those that were doing the bullying. Also, she would always bless my students and other people when we were finishing up a presentation. She would just look at us and say, may you always walk on the sidewalk. And very first year, my students were like, what are you talking about? And luck, Jews, as in other cities, weren't allowed to walk on the street. 
They were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. They had to walk in the gutter. A gutter is sort of like a, a sanitation area where the, the runoff water and all goes through on, on the sides of the street. Um, and so she was walking in the gutter one day, holding her uncle Yannick's hand. They're walking. A Jewish man passes them. They have the Star of David on, and they say hello. Walk a few steps, and Gisela hears a rifle shot. So her uncle grabs her. They run around the corner of the next building and sort of peer to see what was going on. And it turns out that she doesn't remember if they were German or they were Ukrainian soldiers, but they had shot that man that just passed them. And the two soldiers run over. One soldier's making fun of the other soldier because he missed the Star of David. It was a target practice for them. Who could hit the Star of David? And the two soldiers sat there and made a bet how long it would take the Star of David to die. Not the human being, not the man, not even the Jew, but the Star of David. And Gisela said it was like a light bulb going off. We are nothing but objects to these people. We have just become, we're just stars. We're just objects. We're not even human beings anymore. And Gisela realized that was a turning point, that this was going to end badly. And um, she always wanted, she would just tell my students, and basically by saying, may you always walk on the sidewalk, may you always be treated equal, may you always be given your rights. Uh, she was very much about speaking up for your rights and being an upstander and not a bystander. So they're surviving in luck. Remember, she doesn't know what happened to her parents. Her uncle realizes, he's smart enough to realize that something's going to happen one day. So he starts gathering money, gathering uh, supplies. He also has fake IDs made, and he starts looking for a place in the countryside for them to hide. And while all this is going on, the Germans are tightening the, the noose on the Jews. They uh, are going to force the Jews into a ghetto in luck, and that's in December of 41. One day, one of Dr. Yannick's patients come to him and says, Dr. Yannick, you got to get out of here. And this was a Christian patient coming to him, and, and Dr. Yannick still saw some Christians, even though it was illegal. And um, Uncle Yannick said, I know we're, we're leaving. And the man's like, no, you don't understand. You have to get out of here tonight. If you don't leave here tonight, there will not be a tomorrow night for you or any of your family. So they had made plans in the, in the uh, Polish countryside. There was a farmer who said he would take the family in. Uh, he was going to get paid for this, but he would hide the family. And they had this already set up. So they grabbed their fake passports and Gisela, Yannick, Lisa, Emil, Eugenia, and I wrote Gisela down there twice for some reason. I guess she's doubly important. This was on August 18th, 1942. And Gisela was sure of that date because that is the day the, the Luck Ghetto is going to be liquidated. So they got out just in time. It took a couple of days to get to the farm. They get to the farm and the farmer's gotten cold feet. And remember, if this farmer gets caught, he can be killed his neighbors can be killed, his family can be killed, his children can be killed. This collective responsibility that the Nazis use would terrify people naturally. And so the farmer has changed his mind. He says, look, I will let your wife and your two children hide in the barn and they could hide in the hay, but you got to go and this Gisela person's got to go too. I wasn't expecting her. So Uncle Yannick begs and begs and begs uh, for them to at least keep Gisela. Uh, finally, the farmer agrees, but he won't let Yannick stay there. So Yannick goes off to try to find somewhere to stay. And it's uh, assumed that somewhere along the way, Uncle Yannick is going to be murdered because no one ever sees him again. Now, one more last little background. Uncle Yannick was Czech and the farming family was Czech. So in order to be able to survive with them, Uncle Yannick had been teaching Gisela Czech. So she now speaks five languages. Now, Gisela, as smart as she is, has to play like she has, she's just a simple farm girl. Her job is going to be to hide in plain sight. While her aunt and two cousins are hiding in the barn near the hayloft, she is a farm girl working for a uh, room and board. So she has to hide in plain sight. One day, the Gestapo or SS, she's not sure which, comes to the farm doing a routine search. They look all over the farm, you know, straight out of the movies. They've got a pitchfork, you know, digging into the hay to see if there are any bodies. And that night, the farmer comes. They don't find anybody. But that night, the farmer comes to Gisela and said, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work. You got to go. 
your aunt and two children can stay, but you have got to go. And Gisela begs and begs, please let me stay. She's a, a teenage girl now, 17, 18 years old. And he says no. So he sends her on her way. And this is one of the most heavily forested areas of Poland. It is November 42. Uh, so it's getting cold outside. Gisela's wandering around and, and just roaming around. And she knows that there might be other places where she could hide that her uncle told her about. She just can't find them. All of a sudden, she hears a truck and she gets terrified. So she runs and hides behind a tree. And I've got Gisela's journal that I could share with you to read more precisely about this. But basically, the truck is going to stop. And the way her memory was, a bunch of yellow stars floated out of the truck. Nationally, these were Jewish uh, prisoners that the Nazis had. The Nazis then, with Gisela hiding behind a tree, uh, forced the Jews to dig a grave and then shot them all, men, women, children, and babies, and dumped them in the pit and covered the pit and drove away. As you can imagine, Gisela is terrified. She is in shock. She's incoherent. Uh, she doesn't know how much time passed, but she remembers running through the forest and just didn't know what to do. She just she said she was in shock. A couple of days, or it may have been a week later, she doesn't know. There's part of her diary that I can share with you. Uh, a group of Soviet partisans come along. Now, two of the partisans find Gisela quivering behind a tree. They try to make sense of what she's saying, but she's babbling, speaking incoherently. So they go get their commander. They're trying to decide what to do with her. Do we use her? Do we leave her? Do we shoot her? Do we do other unmentionable things to her? They're trying to decide what they're going to do. They bring their commander in, and the commander looks at Gisela listens to Gisela and then looks at his guys. You idiots, he tells them. Listen to what this young girl is saying. So they listen and they're saying, she's just talking gibberish and, and she's incoherent. So the captain or the leader of this partisan group says, yes, she's talking gibberish, but she's talking gibberish in German, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, and Czech. This young girl speaks five languages. We can use her. So he contacts his superior who comes and they decide Gisela is going to be a spy. She's going to be a spy. This teenage girl is going to be a spy for the partisans. They give her training. It's very abbreviated. It's only about a month, she thought. And it's the typical. They teach her to recognize German army insignia, what rank means, how to jot down uh, troop movements, uh, how to uh, record the rank of the people she sees. And they would wake her up. She said about every night, they'd throw water in my face and say, Gisela, Gisela, get up. And she would get up and they would slap her and, and beat her up because she's not Gisela. She has to remember she's not Gisela anymore. She is Veronica. This is her fake ID that she had identifying her as Veronica. Notice they dyed her hair. Gisela had blonde hair. Uh, she now has black hair. And they're going to find a posting for her. And also, she speaks five languages. She has to act like she only speaks rudimentary Polish. She's going to be a, a maid or a worker at places where the Germans frequent. But if they, she turns around and even acts like she recognizes German, she could be put to death. So her first job is at a farm villa working for a German official, and a lot of Germans are going to come there, and they are going to uh, associate, they're going to talk about things. Gisela steals trash every day uh, to, to look through the trash. She tries to jot down and remember as much information as she can about what's going on. She's posing as the uh, previous owner's granddaughter, and she's employed there as a maid or a servant. So that's going to go on, and she is given a contact place. There's a, a local market she goes to once or twice a week. She finds someone selling gourds, and her code is, I want to buy your largest gourds. And if the person answers, I will have a better shipment next week, then she's met her contact. She shares the information and then goes back to the farm to do more spy work. And they just keep meeting like this once or twice a week at the farmer's market. Finally, in June of 43, she gets there and she notices the original Russian commander who found her in the forest is there. 
she almost runs, she panics, she assumes she did something wrong and that they're going to kill her. However, she realizes she doesn't have a choice. She goes to meet him and unbeknownst to her, they are so impressed with her, they give her a promotion. This teenager is now going to be sent to Lyov. And uh, she goes to the train station to meet her new handler. And I actually ordered a 1940s bonnet from Poland to give you an idea of what these bonnets look like. And it's down there. And Gisela wasn't a bonnet wearing type of girl, so she hated this. But she wore a bonnet. And then someone comes up to her and says, you won't need your bonnet tomorrow because it will be cloudy. And then Gisela says, I know, but the bonnet is still fashionable to wear. She's met her new contact. So there in Lyov, uh, this is just some photographs I took. Um, not photographs I took, or some photographs I got off the internet. Here is a map of where she is. You can see the train station over to the left. If you look at this carefully, you see a labor camp. You see five massacre sites. You see the ghetto. And so this is not a very safe place for Jews. Uh, no place was safe for Jews, but look at all the massacres here, and you see a train going to one of the death camps at Belzig. So her apartment is going, remember, she's working undercover. Um, her apartment is actually going to be near the ghetto, and uh, she only remembers it had a rickety table, a rickety chair, a rickety pot and a uh, rickety sink. And that was all that was there. All the, the it had a shared bathroom. She was just a really rundown place, no electricity, but that's where she's staying. She's just a simple Polish girl that's gonna be working here. Can you imagine this teenage girl from a farm in Eastern Poland? She's being sent into the belly of the beast. She is gonna be working at Gestapo headquarters. So she gets situated there. She's a, she's a maid, she's cleaning up. She's a servant there. Uh, stealing whatever information she can. One day she's walking home uh, to her rickety place and someone bumps into her and whispers, meet me at Lubart's castle. So she meets that person that night at Lubart's castle and Gisela is now being asked to go behind the ghetto, I mean the Gestapo headquarters and spy on an, on an ammunition dump. There is an ammunition dump there that the, the underground, the, the partisans are, are in a frenzy to try to blow up. So Gisela's job now is to try to find keys and make, they give her this gummy substance and she makes wax impressions of keys. She also starts chewing a lot of gum to make wax impressions of any keys she can find. One night when she's in her rickety apartment at, uh, in December, she hears a loud explosion. She told me that to her dying day, she will always pray that the However, the, the partisans got into the ammo dump to blow it up. It was her key impression that got them in there. So she's laying back in a rickety place with a smile on her face. She's hoping that that's what she heard. About that time, there's a pounding at her door. And it turns out it's her handler, who is a middle-aged man. He is freaking out that they've got to leave. They've got to leave now. The Gestapo is going to capture them. And Gisela is asking him to chill. My cover's safe. We're, we're, we're fine. We're not going to get caught. But he insists, and he's her boss, that they leave. So they try to sneak out of town. They get caught. They get brought back to what's left of the uh, Gestapo headquarters. He gets put in one cell. And remember, the uh, ammo dump was behind it. So when it blew up, Part of this headquarters was destroyed also. He's put in a cell behind her. She's put in a cell, which is pretty much halfway destroyed. Uh, she remembers the filthy water, the sewage, some dead body parts and all just sort of floating in the water as she's in there. Hearing next door where they are torturing this man, trying to get him to name his contacts. Uh, eventually around morning time, she hears a shot and she assumes he was shot because they came in to her and start questioning her. They start beating her when she won't answer. She's very proud of the fact she never gave any names. So they beat her, they beat her, they break her arm. One of the Germans comes in and is irate that she has blonde hair. You know, how dare her? Only Aryans have blonde hair. Uh, her, her fake hair had, had grown out by now and she had, or her dyed hair, she had blonde hair again. Um, and so he poured lye on top of her hair. Uh, to destroy your hair and destroy your scalp. Um, they break her teeth and knock a bunch of teeth out. But for some reason, and she said, I will never understand why they didn't kill me. 
They branded me with the SS Lightning Bolts, but for some reason, maybe it was because I'm a female, she didn't know why, but they took her and dumped her back in the ghetto. Um, she was just unconscious, laying in the street. She said, evidently, someone dragged me and took care of me, and uh, she remembers living for about four to six weeks on a stairwell uh, in the ghetto until... And guys, there's journal entries where she describes this, and, and I can share that, and you can read it in more detail what life was like uh, during that short time in the ghetto. But they had a deportation from the ghetto, and she was, this is a train that was taking them. I don't know if she was on this train. I don't know where on the train she was, but she's going to be shipped to Madani. They did a roundup, rounded everyone up, all the Jews up, and they sent them to Madani. This is Madani. Uh, this is one of the infamous six killing centers the Nazis used. And this is the entranceway she would have come in on. She got to Maidanik. They were uh, all shoved out of the train. They went through processing. They were divided into two groups. She didn't understand that at first. Why? Uh, a lot of shouting. And she got sent to this building. If you look at the building, it has three chimneys on it. That's where she was sent. They were forced to disrobe. So there was a long line of people uh, naked getting ready to go into this building. We were in Duplin County once, and Gisela was up here talking. It was another auditorium, and she froze. She just stopped in mid-sentence, and then she started touching her back. I knew from experience that Jews would have a Star of David on the front and on the back. Whenever she touched her back, her mind was going back to the war. She started touching her back, and it took her like 30 seconds before she started talking again. I asked her afterwards why. What, what happened? Are you okay? She said in the auditorium as she was talking, the door back there to the right would have opened, and this beautiful blonde-haired teacher walked in, and as the sunlight hit the teacher's hair, she saw, I can't do it with no hair, but she sort of did her hair like that, and she said, just as I said, for that brief instance, that beautiful teacher looked exactly, even the head motion was exactly like the woman that was in front of me at this gas chamber. And that's what the building with three uh, smokestacks, that's the gas chamber. Gisela is going to be pulled out of the line. She later finds out it's because she had those lightning bolts tattooed on her arm, and one of the guards figured she might be valuable. The woman in front of her, that beautiful blonde-haired Jewish girl, was sent in to be gassed. Gisela wasn't. And Gisela would get very emotional. It's like, why am I here? And she isn't. I'm four foot ten. I've got a mole. I thought Gisela was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen in my life. But Gisela saying, here I am. I, I, this, beautiful, this beautiful young lady got gassed to death and I was allowed to live. I mean, in what world is that fair? This is the room they were headed into. This, for the last two summers, I've been able to go to my dining with a group of North Carolina teachers uh, 35 of us each time, and I got to tell Gisela's story at Maidanic, which was an incredible honor to her memory that I was able to do that. Uh, and the only reason I show this is the most heinous thing I've ever seen. If you look at the little hole there to the, the left, that was a peephole that was uh, sealed so that people could watch the gassing process if they wanted to. I can't even fathom that. And this is one of the memorials at uh, Maidanic, um, I could tell you more about that later after the presentation. Uh, it's from Gisela's uh, journal about life in Madonic. Once again, she describes the horrors of living there, how your heart goes out to these new arrivals, but you know not to get close because they probably won't be there forever. There is one incident I wanted to share with you. This is another picture of my classroom. We were talking with Gisela one day, my students and I, and it was very emotional. It was just an extremely emotional day for Gisela. And one of my students, Aaron Crawford, raised his hand and said, Ms. Abramson, it's obvious this hurts you so much. How are you able to do this practically every day of the week or most days of the week? And Gisela got really quiet and lowered her head. And, she, and I never heard this before either. She said, I do this for Anya. And so my students naturally asked, well, who is Anya? And at Maidanik, one of the trains came in one day and this young teenager, not stereotypical looking, she had freckles and red hair. Um, Anya, she later found out it was Anya, got off the train 
And Anya frantically went to one person and then another and then another and then another and then another. And all Anya said, my name is Anya. My father's name is Boris. My mother's name is Kalina. She'd go to the next person. I'm Anya. My father is Boris. My mother is Kalina. For days, that's all this young, red-haired, freckled girl would say to anybody. She'd wake up saying it. She'd go to bed saying it. She wanted everyone to know she was Anya, who had a father named Boris, and who had a mother named Helena. Days later, maybe a week later, uh, Gisela saw that Anya was in that line to the gas chamber. That she, and By that time, if you survived the first couple of days at Madonna, you knew what that room was for. But for the first time, Anya looked content. She wasn't frantically trying to tell people who she was. She just looked content. Uh, for, you could take that for whatever it is. But Gisela said a couple of days later, it, it, she, it dawned on Gisela that this young girl, uh, this young teenager with red hair and freckles just wanted someone to know she existed. That on this planet, there was a young girl named Anya whose father's name was Boris, whose mother's name was Kalina. And that's why she was so frantic, hoping somebody would remember that. Well, Gisela told my students about it. Lisa Coltrane, who lives in this part of the world now, um, uh, she is a defense attorney, I believe. Uh, but she got the information. She collected money from the students. I didn't know any of this was happening and got this plaque. Anya, daughter of Boris and Kalina, who simply wanted to be remembered. And you could see over by the door getting out of my classroom, every one of my students every day for over 20 years saw this plaque. And I can guarantee you they remember who Anya is. Uh, I keep the plaque in the center now. I always talk about Anya. If you want to see it, I've got the plaque up here somewhere. Um, but we remember Anya. My students might forget who I am, but they're going to remember who Anya is. And that's what Anya wanted. She simply wanted to be remembered. So Gisela is at my Donic. These are just a few photographs. The reason she was kept alive and the reason she was pulled out of the line to be gassed two more times is the Germans use her as a translator. Whenever they bring in Russian POWs, Gisela is brought in to translate. Gisela would be sitting here, across from her would be the Russians. There would be two German guards on the side of her, two on the side of the Russian. Uh, and then whenever Gisela asked a question, she would translate it. If she was taking too long, Gisela said they, the, the Germans beat her. If she got, uh, they thought she was mistranslating, the Germans beat her. And if she did everything perfect, the Germans beat her. They just beat her because they could beat her and let her know her place. But that's why she was kept alive as a translator. Now, she did all the other work you had to do to survive, but that was her assignment. Just to backtrack a little bit, uh, Germany had something called a Harvest Festival in November of 1943. Over, their harvest festival killed over 40,000 Jews. That was their harvest festival. And the reason I bring them, that up is some of those Jews were killed at Majdanek. And because of Gisela's position within the sort of power structure as a translator, she knew about this. This is a photograph of the Germans in 43 burning the bodies. Uh, you could see it from the nearby village uh, or nearby town, which was near Majdanek. So Gisela knew that this had happened. She knew where the bodies were buried because of her access as a translator. Here is a Russian photograph, a Russian plane that flown over my Donic. You could see that the Germans are starting to dismantle the camp um, because the Russian army is getting closer and closer. This is in 1944. In 1944, on July 23rd, and Gisela knows this is the date because the camp gets liberated the next day by the Russian army. Gisela and the other remaining Jews that weren't marched off go to this field. This is the field where all these bodies from the Harvest Festival are buried. They are lined up, and Gisela's lined up with the rest of them, but Gisela had an idea of what's going on, because remember, she had been privy to this information. She starts backing up on her own. She starts slowly backing up, and when the Germans start firing on all the Jews, uh, she falls into the pit herself. Um, she figures that's the only chance she has of survival. So the other bodies are shot. They're uh, thrown into the pit on top of her. The next day, the Russians come. This is an actual photograph of the Russians excavating one of the pits. I'm not saying this is one that Gisela was in. It could be, but it could not be also. But over to the side, Gisela had wormed her way through that mass of bodies 
uh, and barely half alive. She had sort of leaped uh, or leaned over the, the beginning of the hole and because there's only a little bit of dirt thrown on top. And that's where the Russians found her. The Russians find her when they liberate the camp. Uh, they see she's still alive. Uh, they give her some water. Uh, they nurse her back to health a little bit. And she immediately begs them, please allow me to live. Please, I can help you. I can, I'm a translator. I speak these five languages. I've worked for the partisans before. So she explains all that. And, and so they take her in. And the only thing she asks for is a Russian uniform because she sees what's happening to girls and females and women that don't have a Russian uniform. Long story short, uh, she works for them for about six months to nine months. Near the end, she knows the war is ending and she has to make a decision. Do I want the war to end with me on the Russian side or the American side? Uh, she decides she's safer with the Americans, so she escapes the Russians, which could have gotten her killed. She makes it to an American displaced persons camp, um, or she's in the vicinity of one. She didn't know it was there, but she collapsed. She's found, and she remembers waking up in the camp. She doesn't know if it was a few days or a week, but she wakes up in the camp, and she remembered distinctly, and she had such a, a powerful way of describing what it felt like to wake up in a clean bed for the first time in six years. She remembers the white, crisp sheets. She remembers that sort of hospital smell. She, she realized she was probably being taken care of because she was cleaned. Uh, she only weighed about 80 pounds or so, but she was physically clean. So she was feeling that maybe things were going to be okay until she heard boots. She knew the sound of boots. And she looks down because Jews were not allowed to look in people's eyes. They had to look down whenever they met you. Look down and sees two army boots marching towards her. So she gets more terrified because whenever she sees army boots, that means trouble. She looks up a little more. And for the first time, she notices the uniform is a slightly different shade of green. Looks up a little more. And for the first time in her life, sees the hand of someone of African, Amer I mean, of African descent. It is an African-American soldier that is working at that DP camp, at that displaced uh, persons camp. The soldier sees she's terrified. And guys, this is an African-American soldier in 1944 or 1945, 44, 45. Um, you can imagine what his experiences must have been like in America. This African-American soldier picks her up, carries her to the window. He's cradling her in his arms and with his chin, points outside to an American flag. And she doesn't speak English, but the words he, he said she understood. Free, safe, America. This is America. You're free. You're safe. This African-American soldier was the first one who allowed Gisela to feel that way in six years. Um, so that was her introduction to America, the first time she met an American. And by the way, she's going to learn English. Uh, later Spanish, so she ended up speaking seven languages. As she's being nursed back to health, uh, the OSS, which is the forerunner of the FBI, comes to her, heard you can speak five languages, now working on number six. We want you to be a spy. We want you to go back to communist Russia. We want you to spy for us. And she's 19 years old, I believe, at this point. She says, I love you guys. You saved me, but that's not happening. Uh, she just did not want to go back into this. She had lived this for six years and had enough. She wanted a taste of life. So she politely and diplomatically turns down the OSS of their generous offer to become a spy. She finds out one of her mother's sisters is in Brooklyn. I remember the aunt she went to stay with, Uncle Yannick and Lucia. That was her mother's sister, and this is her third sister. So they go to stay with her aunt. She communicates with them. Uh, and through communicating with her aunt in Brooklyn, she finds out that her aunt, her other aunt and two cousins who were in hiding, they all survived. So they're going to come to America. And sadly, and this is horrible, uh, only three can come at a time. So they have to leave uh, the boy behind. Uh, Emil is going to come later and he goes to Canada. But they come to Brooklyn. This is a photograph I found of the ship coming in. Somewhere on the ship is Gisela uh, and her aunt and her uh, Eugenia, her her niece, her, her cousin. Uh, this is the, the information from the New York Times about the ship coming in. Here is Gisela during that 
period after the war. This is about a year and a half later. Uh, Gisela went to high school. Remember, that's why they lied about her age. Uh, she got her high school de uh, degree. When she was on the streets of New York one day, uh, she heard a, wom a woman speaking German. And Gisela said she whooped around and looked at this woman and must have given her the most evil look known to man because this woman was terrified when Gisela looked at her. And Gisela realized at that moment there was still so much hate in her heart, she had to let it go if she was going to survive. So because of that woman's look of fright on the streets of New York, Gisela slowly is going to release all of that hatred. Uh, she will forgive, but she won't forget and Gisela ended up getting a scholarship to St. Lawrence College. This is where she went. Her son believed, according to Gisela, that all Gisela did was go to class, come home, work, go back to class, come home and work. I knew that wasn't the Gisela I knew. So using all of this great technology we have today, I went through the St. Lawrence archives and found about 12 newspaper articles about Gisela and all the great work she was doing and all the things she was doing uh, uh, to help refugees in Europe. Gisela is over to the left. Uh, one of her sweet mates is at the bottom. I don't know if anybody in here recognized her, recognizes her, but she works some for the newspaper also. Uh, I should have included a slide. Uh, that sweet mate of hers is Barbara Waters, who made a career out of journalism, to say the least. Um, so she was Gisela. When I tell that to my students, they just look at me like, who's Barbara Waters? Uh, these, are, these are just some of the newspaper articles about things Gisela was doing. She did an interview. I love this one. Uh, Gisela became a teacher, which I'm very proud of. Um, and that's why I wore my tie today with the, the teacher on it. Uh, on this, a family that Gisela sponsored to help come to America, she is tutoring their child who is at PS number seven or number PS eight in Yonkers. And the, the student says, makes a comment about what a good teacher Gisela is. Last summer, I just took a chance and started looking through Yonkers Facebook and actually found this boy's son, who's now in his 50s or 60s. And I sent him this information, is this your dad, just curious. And it turns out it was. So he said his father was actually still alive, but had never talked about the war. And sending him this information about Gisela got them talking about the war and the war years and, and hopefully brought them a little closer. But it was a neat story to be able to share with Gisela's son. Uh, her son, Michael, is the chair of the Holocaust Council now. This is the proudest day in Gisela's life. It's when she became an American citizen on March 20th, 1950. These are some photographs of Gisela, the Gisela I knew. In the bottom left-hand corner is her and her husband, Paul. Uh, she met Paul on a blind date. The only problem was Paul was the other girl's date. So they had to work their way through that little kerfuffle and they fell in love and, and, and stayed uh, together for the rest of their lives. This is a painting of Gisela at her temple. Uh, she was a teacher there also. Uh, one To end on one last thing, and we're one a minute or two late here, so I apologize. When Gisela moved to North Carolina in 1973, she developed a close group of friends, and they decide, this is 1973, that North Carolina needs to do more for Holocaust education. This is a group of friends that she would meet with regularly at her house. Uh, the second person is actually a Baptist minister, uh, Dr. Scoggin. He and Gisela become best friends in 1973, and they passed away within one week of each other in 2011. So they dreamed, and this is Gisela's dream and their dream, they had five dreams for North Carolina. Their first dream was the creation of a council on the Holocaust here. 1981, Gisela's dream comes true. North Carolina becomes the first state to have a, a council on the Holocaust, uh, and thanks to Governor Hunt for that. Their second goal is to have a commemoration. That happens the next year. The council has a commemoration uh, every year in Raleigh. There's also commemorations throughout the state uh, commemorating the Holocaust. Dream number two. Dream number three, she wanted teacher workshops on the Holocaust. The council, and I'm, I'm part of the team that does that now, could continuing Gisela's dream. Uh, the first one was in 1990. I went to my workshop in 1991. I actually have the book saved from them. I'm a teacher pack rat. 
and Gisela's name is in it where she wrote down her phone number uh, for me to give her a call. Dream number four, sadly, Gisela did not live to see, but she wanted a law mandating Holocaust education. That's now been passed. It's part of the law now, and we're doing professional development. In fact, they named the law after Gisela, Gisela Abramson Holocaust Education Act. And her fifth dream or goal was a monument honoring victims of the Holocaust. And Victoria Milstein, who is an artist, uh, created this sculpture. It's in Greensboro at uh, uh, La Briar Park. I may have the wrong name of the park, but it's Women of the Shoah. It's called uh, She Wouldn't Take Off Her Boots. And I could tell you more about that later. But those were Gisela's dreams. And just my small part, I created a workshop another workshop, a center for resources for teachers and named it after Gisela, Gisela Gross Abramson. And guys, I know I went over a little bit. I apologize. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer those or I could talk with you afterwards. And, and thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. I think it shows the dangers of allowing a state to go unchecked and to to pass laws to, to go against a a group that is considered the others, that we need to be very vig vigilant about that. It also shows the dangers of unchecked um, discrimination against any group or any organization. It also, we, we need to be very careful not to overemphasize this, but it also shows that people do stand up in adversity. It, it was a small number, but people do make a difference. And the way, the main reason I personally did this is I want my teacher, my students to be upstanders and to take charge of their own life and their own community. And I want them to, to be a constant check on things like this happening again. I know some people would argue this could only happen in Germany, and that's not true. It could happen anywhere. Uh, and we need to be constantly vigilant about that. I don't know if that answers your question. I could. There's an official 10 reasons why at the museum, the Holocaust Museum in D.C. But to me, it just boiled down to, I want my students to be upstanders, not bystanders. My first year in college, I heard something awful when I was out at a hardware store, and it was said in front of people that were young, and I, to this day, I regret not speaking up and being an upstander and saying something. And I don't want my students or anyone I, I associate with, I want them to be upstanders. That's, Thank you, Mr. Holden. Just really, I know you guys have to. I just want to show you a couple quick things. You've probably seen this famous photograph of Elie Wiesel at uh, at Buchenwald at Auschwitz, and the reason I bring it up is the gentleman on the second row. And I could show you which one was Elie Wiesel. I should have circled it. He lives in Charlotte now. He was a, a survivor that moved to North Carolina. This famous photograph of Ebensee, the guy in the back. Uh, left. Uh, he's Zeb Harrell. He lives in uh, in Greensboro. Now, he still speaks to groups. Uh, we had 10 survivors that were at Auschwitz. We can learn from them when we study uh, uh, night. We look, read Elie Wiesel's book. I know everyone's heard of Anne Frank. Uh, this is a photograph, the blonde-haired girl with Anne over Barbara Rodman. She lives in North Carolina now. She was a good friend of Margot and Anne Frank. There are lots of survivors here. There's lots of North Carolina stories. In fact, 304 people moved to North Carolina. So when we study this, I just think it's important we look at our own state and that our students are going to be more apt to be uh, attentive and want to learn about something if they know that this is something that affected their neighbors. And I just wanted to show you those real quick. But thank you, guys. I'm available whenever you have questions. My pleasure. And guys, I do have up here a few of the things I talked about. The two posters, we're doing a 40 poster exhibit on survivors that moved to North Carolina, and we're finishing that up. So I just brought two of them. 
Uh, they'll be in nicer frames when we do this. These are like the frames I used to hang things in my dorm. So um, there's a, just an example. Two of the 40 will have, and I've got the plaque and a few other things up here. But thank you, and I'm available if anybody has any questions. And I guess I can walk away from the camera. <laughs>